Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jamie. I'm the Visitor Engagement Coordinator at Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. Thank you for attending um, How the Hattori's Became St. Louisans. Uh, so we are open. So as a Missouri History Museum, Soldiers Memorial is open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 to 5 p.m. Um, vac vaccinated visitors can choose whether or not to wear masks. Uh, we'd love for you to come down. And uh, starting this Saturday, we've got a new exhibit opening uh, that this program is in connection with. So the new exhibit is called Writing Wrong, Japanese Americans and World, War and World War II. Um, it is a traveling exhibit from the National Museum of American History, uh, which is a Smithson part of the Smithsonian Institute. So my spiel on that is uh, writing wrong Japanese Americans in World War II was developed by the National Museum of American History and adapted for travel by the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service. The national tour received federal support from the Asian Pacific American Initiatives Pool administered by the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, the Terasaki Family Foundation, and CLN and Ginger Liu. Uh, and uh, at Soldiers, we've gotten support with uh, public programming and research uh, on kind of local stories relevant to the exhibit from the Japanese American Citizens League, uh, among other individuals and institutions. So before we get rolling, uh, I need to mention a few things about how these Zoom programs work, for, you know, in case anybody hasn't been to a million of them already. Um, this will be about a 40 minute presentation, uh, hopefully followed by 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A. If you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A box. I'll be monitoring the box and then I'll relay them to our speaker uh, at the end of the program. Um, please don't use the chat function because I, I won't be checking there. Today's presentation is being recorded, so if you'd like to view it again or share it with anyone else, it'll be posted to the Missouri Historical Society's YouTube channel, which I'll be linking in the chat. And finally, your feedback is always important to us. After you close out the webinar, uh, your browser should automatically open a short survey. If you'd be willing to take a couple minutes to fill that out, we'd uh, really appreciate it. Uh, and I'm gonna put a couple links in the chat for um, if you're interested in membership and joining the newsletter uh, and for the YouTube channel. So with, with all of that, I'll introduce today's speaker. Her name is Robin Hattori and she's a board member of the St. Louis chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League. Uh, she's gonna be giving us a general introduction to the topic of, uh, of the exhibit, which is uh, the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, and she's also going to be uh, sharing with us some of her family history. Take it away, Robin. All right, thank you so much, Jamie, and thank you to everyone who's here tonight. Um, bear with me as I deal with technology here. I'm gonna advance the slide. Okay, so I hope everyone can see my first slide, how the Hattori's became St. Louisans, one family's incarceration during World War II. And a few caveats. Um, first of all, I am not a historian, so I did my best to give you some accurate facts, but um, you know, I, I'm not an expert in World War II, so um, keep that in mind. Also, I believe I have some family members on this call, and they may hear me say something that they're thinking that's not accurate. <laughs> so I apologize in advance if I get any of those uh, anecdotes incorrect, but um, feel free to, to shoot me an email after and let me know if there's anything I can do to clean up this presentation. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is based on stories I've heard in my family, um, a little bit of research I've done on my own, and also a wonderful book that was written by a St. Louis woman named Judy Mundell, who was friends with my eldest aunt um, and recently published a book about her life. So. Um, what I'd like to do is go through all of these slides, and I've uh, encouraged Jamie to encourage you, as he said, to ask any questions you would like, no topics off limits, and uh, be happy to answer whatever I can. I also wanted to say a word about terminology. Um, I have always used the word internment to describe what happened to my family and others during World War II. Recently, a lot of people have discouraged the use of the word internment and they say incarceration is a better descriptor. Um, some people call them concentration camps. Um, so I, I, I use internment because out of habit more than anything, um, but I do understand that, you know, people have different ideas about how they describe um, 
this portion of history. So I'm going to start in Japan, which is where my family is from. I am a third generation Japanese American, which is called Sansei in Japanese. And if you can imagine Japan in the late 1800s and early 1900s, it was a very different place than what we know about Japan today. Um, it was a relatively poor country. It was highly militarized um, with a lot of power skirmishes with China and Russia, among others. Um, and it was a difficult place to live. So uh, there was a lot of Japanese who were interested in immigrating to other countries where they felt like they could perhaps, um, you know, have a better dream, a better future for themselves. Among those were my mother's family. My mother's surname is Mitori, um, which apparently is kind of an unusual name. This is my grandmother on the right when she was 18. This is her passport photo that she took when she made the crossing um, to America. The photo on the left is my grandma there with my grandpa. And my grandpa was the first one to come over. He uh, came to the United States in 1907. Uh, he was also 18 years old. And a big motivator for him to immigrate was he was the second son in his family. Therefore, he was not going to inherit land or anything from his family. If you were the firstborn son, you stood to inherit everything. Um, but after that, you know, you were pretty much on your own. And so knowing that he um, wasn't going to inherit anything from his family, he decided with only a fourth grade education that he would uh, try to make his fortune in the United States. Um, he settled into a farming life in the San Joaquin Valley of California, which is in Northern California. Um, he got a motorcycle and he explored up and down the coast for about 10 years. And he sent um, money home to his family. So he pretty much had a good time between the ages of 18 and 28. He was sort of living the life. Um, at some point, his family said to him, okay, you've been messing around for 10 years in America, and we need you to um, think about settling down. So we'd like to uh, arrange for you to have a bride. And um, it was not unusual in those times. They actually arranged for him to marry one of his relatives. Um, and my grandma was, I think, a second cousin of his. So she actually had the same name as he did. They were both last name Matori. And she vaguely remembered him because he did grow up across the street from her. Um, but my grandmother was, um, she had a little bit more education. She had a seventh or eighth grade education. And she came from the side of the family that uh, owned a shop. So it was a merchant family. Um, her job in that family was to raise the silkworms um, that spun the silk that then they would turn into cloth for kimonos. And so um, you see in this picture the kimono she's wearing, and I actually have one of her kimonos that was spun from the cloth that came from the silkworms that she raised. So that's a pretty precious item. Sorry to interrupt, Robin. I just have to cut in really quick. I forgot yep. to mention a couple uh, accessibility features tonight. Um, if anybody needs closed captioning, uh, you can hit the CC button at the bottom of uh, the Zoom window. Uh, and we have a couple of ASL interpreters on tonight. Ellen Prize and Kathleen Roberts will be uh, interpreting tonight if, uh, if anybody needs ASL interpretation. So thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. I'm glad we got that. Um, and so anyway, when, once my grandmother arrived and um, got married to my grandfather, they quickly settled into that farming life. Um, they planted a lot of tomatoes, celery, cantaloupes, things like that. At that time, it was not legal for immigrants um, like them to own their own land in America. So they leased land in the name of their eldest daughter because she was an American citizen. Um, and they moved around quite a bit, um, but they ended up having nine children. And my mother, Anne, is the youngest of those nine. My father's family uh, has got some similarities. On the left, you see my, uh, my grandfather and my grandmother. 
Um, my grandfather on my father's side, this is the Hattori side, he definitely was concerned about the militarization of Japan that was going on around this time. And he wanted to avoid um, what happened in 1905, which was the Russo-Japanese War. He was not interested in being a soldier and going to war. Um, so that is how he initially was motivated to immigrate. And um, he worked on railroads. He worked at a salmon fishery and cannery in Alaska. Um, he was prone to seasickness. So that was short, a short stint. He also did a lot of farming. Apparently, he had to farm a lot of onions. And for the remainder of his life, he always hated onions because he had too many of them during this phase. Um, his was a typical picture bride situation in which when his family said, it's time for you to settle down, um, they had two potential women who he could marry and they sent the pictures over. Um, we always joke about this in our family because he looked at the two pictures and he picked what he said was the pretty one. And the pretty one said she did not want to move to America. So he ended up with the other one who was not the pretty one, and that was my grandma. <laughs> so she never let him forget that she knew she was second choice, but she kept him in line for that. Um, they had a similar farming life as my mother's side of the family. They moved a lot. Um, and again, they were able to capitalize off of their children's US citizenship in order to make a living. Um, on the right here, you see this is my grandfather and grandmother, and this is the start of their, or, most of their children, they did have eight children. The youngest of their eight children was my father, and he is the little guy right here. Okay, so we all know what happened in 1941, December 7th. Um, and we were trying to stay out of the war as it was raging in Europe, but when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, in Hawaii, we pretty much knew that at that point on, America was going to be joining World War II. And as you can imagine, it was terrible for anyone uh, living in the United States, but it was especially terrible for Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans, like my mother and father, um, because there was a lot of uncertainty at this time about what was going to happen now that Japan had entered the war uh, against the United States. As you can see from here, there was a backlash against Japanese, um, and this was especially common on the West Coast where there were a lot of Japanese immigrants. Um, this photo that I got from the internet, Japs keep moving, this is a white man's neighborhood, is one example of the types of ways that um, prejudice started to rear its ugly head during this time. Um, there was also Korean and Chinese immigrants living on the West Coast at this time who would wear buttons on their clothes that said, I'm not a Jap, so they could feel like they could distinguish themselves um, and not be lumped in with the Japanese. <clears throat> there was a lot of suspicion from the government that Japanese people living on the West Coast were somehow aiding the Japanese government in the war against America. Um, there were accusations and suspicions of spying and subterfuge. And just to give you an example of how paranoid people were getting, one of my uncles um, had a heat lamp over a chicken egg nest, <laughs> and he used to incubate the eggs. Um, the FBI actually came and seized that whole contraption because they thought he was using this lamp to signal to Japanese ships off the harbor um, to tell them when it was safe to come and attack, when actually all he was doing was um, incubating chickens. Another family story to illustrate um, the tension of the times, my uncle on my father's side was a chemistry buff. He was, uh, I believe, a high school student, and he used to tinker around with the chemistry set some of you may remember having that as children. Um, one day he was in the shed messing around with his chemistry set and he caused a minor explosion in the shed. Um, nothing got injured except his pride. But um, again, shortly thereafter, agents from the US government came to the house and took him away for questioning because they 
suspected that he was building some type of explosives that were going to be used um, for the Japanese side against Americans. And again, he was a teenager. So tensions were running high. And as you see in the background here, uh, eventually this culminated in Executive Order 9066, which President Franklin Roosevelt uh, signed and authorized so that all persons of Japanese ancestry living along the West Coast and a few and a few other places um, were ordered to gather and be assembled so that they could be rounded up. Um, <clears throat> this encompassed about 120,000 people in total. And of that number, about two thirds of them were US citizens who were born here um, and who had never visited Japan before in their lives. Um, it is telling that, you know, at this time, a similar action was not brought against Italian Americans or German Americans, even though they were also fighting with the Axis powers. The first place that, oops, excuse me, the first place that uh, the family arrived at was assembly centers. And these were um, just rough shacks that were built and they were um, meant to house people temporarily. So everyone had one week to gather up what they could um, carry. They were not allowed to bring anything other than what they could carry and uh, arrive at these assembly centers. And so for example, for my family, that was um, a racetrack. Um, other people assembled at old fairgrounds and they built these types of shacks. And according to my eldest aunt, um, you know, they, they were built, they had like tar paper, um, pretty soon grass grew up, um, underneath the tar paper and kind of went through the floor. Um, there was a lot of holes, the walls did not go all the way up to the ceiling. So there was really no privacy. Um, and the you know, the big thing was the bathrooms, the showers and the toilets were all communal um, without even doors or partitions separating them. So that was quite a shock um, for people who were used to having privacy. Um, in order to get to these assembly centers, of course, the Japanese and Japanese Americans had to quickly vacate their housing and they had to leave behind lots of things, possessions, pets, businesses. Um, if they were lucky, they might have had a friend or somebody who was willing to hang on to some things for them while they were gone. But for the most part, um, they had to sell things quickly or give them away. And my grandfather on my father's side, um, he had saved over $200 to buy a refrigerator prior to the war. And it was his prized possession. He loved his refrigerator, but um, he ended up selling it for $10 to somebody um, just because he needed to get rid of it quickly. Uh, my family ended up um, here at this assembly center from April to October. Um, at that point, you know, they really didn't know what was going to happen next, but in October, they were informed that they were going to be moved to a more permanent camp. And the permanent camp are um, what I've called internment centers or incarceration centers. You can see on this map here that there were a number of them um, housing 10,000 people, 20,000 people in Arizona, et cetera. So <clears throat> imagine this, you're in California, you've been at this assembly center for a number of months, and now you're being told you're going to be sent away to a permanent place. Um, for my parents, they, both sides of my family, mother and father, um, they were put on a train and they really did not know where they were going, but they were on a train for, for several days. Um, they were not allowed to open the windows in this train. They had to keep the shades down. And that was because um, the military said it was for their own safety. Um, but another theory is that, you know, basically the government didn't want people to see what they were doing. They were putting all these people in trains. Um, which sounds very similar if you think about it to things, things you've heard about happening in Europe to Jewish people. Um, my family went from California to Rower, Arkansas, which as you see on this map is one of the easternmost camps. Um, Rower and Jerome were both located in Southern Arkansas. Um, and so that is where they ended up. 
here's a picture of what the camp looked like in Rower when it was built. Um, as you can see, it's orderly. Uh, the barracks look a little bit better built than the assembly centers, um, but there's not much around there. It's pretty dry and dusty. Um, there was a town about um, 10 or 20 miles away from here, but otherwise there's pretty much nothing in this camp. Um, <clears throat> everyone um, lived by family, and I was able to get this map which shows um, where some families lived. There's a, a wonderful woman who does research on the camps and she's been trying to track down who lived where. She did find um, the Matori family, my mother's family here, and she found the Hattori family over here. So my mom and dad were sort of neighbors when they were like four and five years old. <laughs> the other interesting thing for those of you who are fans of Star Trek, George Takei, um, who played Mr. Sulu, his family was also interned in Rower. Um, and the Takei family is here in the pink. So they were right here in this block. As you can see from this map, there were things like a church, a high school, elementary school, a hospital. Um, so it very much became a small town in and of itself because there was a community of 10,000 people living here. Um, of course, they had to have educational facilities and health facilities and administrators, um, but it was all contained. If you can imagine all of this within barbed wire and there was no ability to leave. Um, there were armed guards uh, around the perimeter who had their guns trained inside on the people living there. Everyone ate together at a mess hall. And um, this was considered particularly undignified for my grandfather. Um, he felt like putting everybody together and having no control over the family was not how he wanted to run his household. Um, so he would instruct his daughters to, to get their food and to come back to the barracks and that they would eat together as a family, a family unit. And he tried to preserve that idea instead of get absorbed into this larger, noisy, messy population of people. Um, but of course, for the children, I think, especially my mother and father talk about, you know, as kids, they didn't know any better. So they quite enjoyed having their friends around and being able to play and eat with them. Um, so it was a different experience depending on whether you, want to, you were an adult or a teenager or a young child. Um, but the reality is you were living in uncomfortable conditions. Um, generally, the um, size of these barracks were um, 20 square feet. They did not, in the assembly centers, they did not have electricity <laughs> or running water. Here in the barracks, they did actually have a single light bulb coming down, so that was good. Um, they did also have um, water and they had some partitions in the bathrooms, which was very much appreciated, especially by the women. Um, as far as what they ate, my understanding is that they ate a lot of pork and beans and spam. You'll meet a lot of Japanese Americans who either love spam or hate spam because um, they ate so much of it during the war. <laughs> um, this picture, I love this picture. This is my, my grandmother on my mother's side. And she's probably in her early 40s in this picture. She looks older, I think. Um, and this is my mother. I don't know exactly how old my mother is in this picture, but she looks like she's maybe four years old or so. Um, and this is outside their barracks. And you can see how they have tried to make it a more livable place by having some plants and planting some crops. Um, again, nobody was telling them anything, so they didn't know how long they were going to be here. But it became apparent that they were not going to go home anytime soon. So that's when they started to plant gardens and do what they could to make life bearable. Um, they were not allowed to have radios in camp. Um, because, you know, the government did not want them having access to that information about what was going on in the war. So they were pretty much in an information vacuum. And for all of us today, as we're all glued on our cell phones and on the internet every minute of the day, 
it, it's hard to fathom, you know, being stuck in a, a camp in the middle of nowhere and you have no access to outside information at all. You only know what's being fed to you by um, the authorities at the camp. But this is the existence they had. Um, and, you know, they made the best of it. In the winter, it got quite cold and um, they had simple chimneys. It was a pot belly stove. Um, there was no insulation, of course, in these barracks. So, um, you know, we think of Arkansas as being in the South, but with, with no insulation in the walls, it did get quite cold in there. And, um, you know, they did, they did their best to um, have entertainment. My aunt says that they showed movies, sometimes old movies. Um, they tried to have dances for the young people. They didn't have the luxury of things like punch um, to drink, so they would take water and they would find some way to dye it with red dye so it looked like punch. Um, everyone at this point had, uh, well, I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people at this point had what is called shikata ganai as their attitude. Shikata ganai is a, a Japanese term that means it cannot be helped. We have to accept what is happening around us because there's nothing we can do about it. Um, so that is where they were. Uh, at some point, I don't know the exact date, but at some point during all of this, uh, the US government decided they wanted to send a loyalty questionnaire out to everyone in the camps. And this questionnaire had some very benign questions like, you know, what is your age? How many children do you have? Where were you born? Um, but there were two questions that were controversial. Number 27 was, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the US on combat duty wherever ordered? And number 28, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the US from any or all attack by foreign or domestic forces and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor or any other foreign government power or organization. This particular part of the questionnaire caused controversy um, in all of the camps because there was a group of people who said, we just need to, or we just need to say yes. Yes, we're willing to fight for the US, we're US citizens. Yes, we're willing to swear our allegiance to you. Um, this is who we are. But there were some people who said, wait a minute, <laughs> the government puts us behind bars, takes away our freedom, takes away our property, and now is saying, oh, you have to fight for us. Um, you know, no, that's crazy. And in addition, the second question about will you forswear allegiance to the Japanese emperor was seen by some as a trick question because um, a lot of these people didn't have uh, existing allegiance <laughs> to the Japanese emperor, especially if they were US citizens born here and they'd never been to Japan. Um, they, they felt like they couldn't answer, well, I'm going to forswear my allegiance because they didn't have it to begin with. So factions formed um, on these questions, people who answered yes to these questions and people who answered no. And the people who answered no were called no-no boys. Um, they were then branded as troublemakers who potentially would, um, you know, rebel against the the uh, internment authorities and cause trouble, um, you know, maybe in a more major way later in the line. So the no-no boys um, had some problems. Um, and this directly affected my family uh, in that my Aunt Janice, who was my eldest aunt on my father's side, she was about 20 years old when she went into the camps. And she quickly had to work with the camp authorities because she was bilingual in Japanese and English, which was a very useful skill. Um, and they identified her quickly as someone that they could work with. And they made her what's called a block manager. So her job was to be a liaison between residents um, at certain barracks and rower and the administration and to help with uh, disputes that were coming up or communication that needed to happen. And it just so happened that my aunt um, 
fell in love and got married with a man in camp named Kei Koizumi. Um, and he was uh, what we call Kibe, which was someone who, or I don't know if he was Kibe or not, actually, I shouldn't say that. But he, um, he anyway, wanted to answer no on the loyalty questionnaire. Um, he was particularly upset that uh, this question was being asked uh, while he was behind barbed wire. So he was one of the no-no boys. And as a result, he was sent to Tule Lake, California, um, which was where all the no-no boys were put. And this was a camp with harsher conditions, much more strict. Um, and of course my aunt, uh, you know, ended up going with him. Um, she had a baby while she was in camp and it was a really rough time for my grandmother um, to lose her eldest daughter. Uh, you know, she came all the way to Arkansas, but then at this point she was shipped back to California with her husband and her baby. And I'll tell you more about Aunt Janice in a second. The other person um, that's interesting here is my Uncle Hal. He is the younger brother of Aunt Janice. And there he is at the barracks. I think they're watching a baseball game. Um, <clears throat> my Uncle Hal, this is his draft card. Um, he was exactly the draftable age during the war. And so he answered yes, yes on the loyalty questionnaire. And afterwards he was drafted into the US Army. Um, because he also spoke some Japanese, he was sent to the Pacific. And um, for my grandmother, uh, she now you know, lost her freedom. Um, and then she lost her eldest daughter and her eldest son. So um, it was a very tough time for her. I'm going to jump to the end of the war here um, and just say, um, you know, most of you know what happened on the left here is um, the atomic bomb um, remnants of the dome in Hiroshima, which ended the war um, between Japan and the US. And um, the end of the war brought mixed feelings for the Japanese Americans while they were living in the camps. They um, on one hand, were thrilled that the war was over and they were hoping they could go back to normal life. On the other hand, there was uh, still lingering resentment against Japanese people and um, they knew a lot of them had lost uh, their businesses and livelihoods, so there was very little to go back to in California. Um, they were also additionally worried about their friends and family in Japan. Um, and my uncle, the one who was sent to Tule Lake with my Aunt Janice, um, his family was actually from Hiroshima. So that was a particularly um, difficult time for my aunt. After uh, the war, she did go to Hiroshima with her husband and live here, um, where she was not treated particularly well by the locals um, who saw her as uh, an American trader, more or less. Um, and, uh, you know, because the war had devastated Japan and they were in Hiroshima where there was nothing, sometimes she survived on a potato a day. Um, she became incredibly malnourished um, while she was living in Hiroshima. Um, one of the things that helped keep her alive was my Uncle Hal, who was serving in the U.S. Army at that time and was stationed in Japan. He would box up all of his MREs, his um, meals from the army and he would send them to her. And um, that is one of the stories in our family that, uh, you know, he helped keep her alive with rations from the US Army. When my families left the camp, um, both sides decided not to go back to California. And um, I think the idea was just, they wanted to start fresh. And for my mother's family, she, their family ended up in Peebley, Missouri, which is outside of St. Louis. And my grandfather got a job as a caretaker um, at an estate. And um, because he had a farming background and everything, this was a good fit for him. Um, my uncle who is um, deceased now used to say to us that um, my grandfather died during the war and I, did, I couldn't understand that because I said, well, I thought I heard grandpa move to Peebley and he was a caretaker and, you know, he 
he then sub subsequently had a heart attack a number of years later and died, but I don't understand why you say he died during the war. And my uncle said he died spiritually during the war because um, living in the conditions of the camp basically took away sort of his will to live. And even though he regained his freedom after the war, he never quite recovered from that experience. Um, and so he did die at a pretty young age. Um, my other, my father's side of the family moved directly to St. Louis. There is a story, and I don't know if it's 100% true or not. <laughs> the story is that everyone was leaving the camps in Arkansas. They got on the train. Uh, the government gave them something like $20 to relocate. And they had heard to, uh, going to Chicago was a great way to go because Chicago was a big city. There'd be jobs there. Um, so they got on the train, but they were hot and they were tired. And the train stopped in St. Louis on the way to Chicago. Uh, and in St. Louis, there was some volunteers, I believe, from a Quaker society, and they had lemonade and cookies, um, and they were so welcoming and nice to the Japanese Americans on the train that a lot of them just said, heck, we'll just stay here. I don't want to get back on the train and go to Chicago. Um, so that is how apparently my father's family and a number of other St. Louis families ended up staying in St. Louis. Um, and I like that story. I'm not sure, like I said, if it's 100% true, but I like it because it speaks to the welcoming nature of people living in this city and um, understanding what these people had gone through during the war and not holding that against them um, and bringing them into the fold. So I quite like that. Um, one of the things I put on this page is this restrooms, white and colored. Uh, when my family was living on the West Coast, they were surrounded by a lot of immigrants, a lot of Asian immigrants. There weren't a lot of black people out there at that time. Um, and what was a shock for them when they came to the Midwest was how segregated everything was. And so when, um, you know, when they were not in the camps and they were out experiencing life in the Midwest, suddenly they were confronted with this question of what am I? Because I don't think I'm white and I don't think I'm colored, <laughs> but there's no option for me. Um, and my aunt talks about, you know, going on the bus and going to sit in the back where the colored people sat um, and being told, no, you need to sit in the front um, or going to a water fountain and not knowing if they were allowed to drink from the water fountain or not. Um, so it's an interesting thing to think about as we think about identity. And um, we know that in St. Louis, for example, we have a lot of racial issues. Um, particularly, there's a lot of dialogue between black and white communities. Um, there's this whole other group of people who are sometimes unsure of where they fit in that conversation. Um, <clears throat> the other picture I have here post-war is this picture, which shows a citizenship class um, this is uh, a group of Japanese women who are studying for U.S. citizenship. Um, it, it, as I said before, they were not allowed to become citizens or own land, but uh, post-war, some of these laws started to change. And um, my grandma is this person right here. Um, and you can see that she's smiling, which I love, because if you remember the picture I showed you earlier with her and my mother, she looked so sad and solemn in that picture um, while she was in the camps. And in this picture, when she's studying um, about the US government and what she needs to do to become a citizen, she looks happy. Um, so I feel happy for her. So um, going more towards the present, uh, as we got into the late 1970s, there started to be a movement of people who wanted um, some compensation, some apology, some gesture from the government to rectify what had happened during the war. And this movement was called Redress. Um, it was largely led by the Japanese American Citizens League as well as others. And um, they lobbied and somehow, miracle of miracles, they were able to get the law passed in 1988. Ronald Reagan is here signing the law. Um, and what they got was an apology and this is the apology letter. I got this from my aunt's files, um, which says a monetary sum in words alone cannot restore lost years or erase painful memories. Neither can they fully convey our nation's resolve to rectify injustice 
and uphold the rights of individuals. We can never fully right the wrongs of the past, but we can take a clear stand for justice and recognize that serious injustices were done to Japanese Americans during World War II. And this is signed by George Bush, um, who came after Reagan. And every survivor received a check for $20,000, um, including my parents. Again, what's sad is like people like my grandmother and grandfather who really were the ones that suffered the most during the war had already um, passed away by the time this law was um, put into motion. But it's, it's an interesting template that I think a lot of people today are looking back to as they're discussing things like reparations um, for Black Americans um, due to slavery. And you know, certainly there were some lessons learned that I hope the Japanese Americans can share with other minority groups. Um, why I'm giving this talk today, and I hope that it's been interesting for you, is I do think it's important to remember the past and to that end, I took my mother and father to Rower a couple of years ago. Uh, if you remember all those barracks I showed you in the pictures before, this is what Rower looks like now. Um, so all of the barracks are gone, but they have a simulated guard tower. It's much smaller than the actual one with some panels talking about this is what used to be here. Um, in the nearby town of McGee, Arkansas, there is also a small museum with some artifacts and um, you know, some nice history about what happened here. Um, <clears throat> here's my mother and father when they went. And uh, like I said, they were children when this happened. So um, maybe it was not as emotionally traumatic for them as if they were older, like some of their brothers and sisters. But I do think it was moving for them to see this site um, they visited the cemetery where a number of people were buried. Um, <clears throat> and they got to just think about their families and what they went through and what they sacrificed. Another part of that day um, was George Takei did come and visit. Um, and he's a brilliant speaker. He talked a lot about um, how we have to remember the past in order to be good advocates for the future. And, you know, that is something that um, I believe in and I believe a lot of people who touched internment, you know, also agree with. And my husband, who is very active in Japanese American community activities, um, got involved in 2019 um, because one of the places that was an assembly center that detained uh, Japanese Americans during World War II was a small place called Fort Sill, Oklahoma. It was not on that map I showed you earlier because it was a small um, fort that only held 700 Japanese Americans. But this fort has a history. It was the place where Geronimo was kept when he was captured. Um, and about 400 Apache Indians were also incarcerated there. Um, and Geronimo died there actually. Um, so you have the American Indians who were held there and then the Japanese Americans who were held there and in 2019, my husband got involved in a movement because the Trump administration was talking about using that site to detain um, migrant children who were going to be separated from their parents at the border. Um, this is very distressing to hear something like that. And um, there was a big protest that was organized um, mainly by the Jewish community, but a lot of Japanese Americans joined in and said, this will not stand. Um, we cannot keep repeating history over and over again. And in fact, the Trump administration backed down and they ended up not using Fort Sill to detain children. Um, so that was one small victory in a much larger fight. Um, but I give that example to just share with you, you know, in this day and age, I think there's a lot of ways we have to be allies with each other. And um, when we look at how we talk about immigration, when we look at treatment of Muslim Americans after 9-11, when we talk about reparations, you know, post-slavery. Um, this is where I see this story fitting in. And my hope is that um, as we recognize the injustices that happen for Japanese Americans, we can also think about how that applies and can be helpful towards other social justice causes. 
So sorry to get a little preachy on you, <laughs> but I did put my um, email address here and I'm happy to answer questions. We're going to break um, and Jamie's going to moderate, but if we end up not having enough time, you're always welcome to um, contact me. Uh, and like I said, I'm not an expert, so I also welcome corrections and additional information. So I'll stop there and go to Jamie. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, as a reminder to everyone, uh, if you have any questions for Robin, uh, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window there. That's going to be the best place for us to find them. We don't have any audience questions yet. Um, so I just want to mention a couple things that came up for me while you were speaking. Um, I had forgotten that Janice Koizumi was your aunt. Uh, and she's actually featured in the exhibit. Mm -hmm. Because the the kind of the it's a traveling exhibit uh, from the Smithsonian Institute, um, but some folks at the Missouri Historical Society did uh, research into into local stories that connect with it, uh, and and Janice Koizumi's story is one of those stories. Um, so uh, I, I was actually just looking at you know the the progress of the install uh, of the exhibit today, and uh, and saw her her panel up there. Uh, cool. So that, yeah, that was that was really cool to see. Um, so that that's open. The exhibit is opening. I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug it again. The exhibit is opening uh, this Saturday, uh, July 24th, and that's only gonna be running for 10 weeks. So be sure to come down and check it out if you're interested. Um, oh, we do have an audience question. I appreciate your very informative and interesting presentation, Robin. I really enjoyed your presentation and learned new family stories. Great job, Suzy Shimamoto. <laughs> that's my cousin. <laughs> Thanks, Suzy. Uh, and Susie's father also does presentations like this as well. Um, he, let's see, his oldest brother was born in the camps. Um, he was not born in the camps, but a little bit later. Um, and he's here in St. Louis. And he also has some interesting stories to tell about my mother's side as well as his father's side. You mentioned uh, several family members fought in World War II. Did any fight in the 442nd? Uh, not to my knowledge, I don't have family members who are in the 442nd. Um, if you do go to the exhibit, which I highly encourage, um, you'll hear about the Tanaka brothers. And um, they are three brothers uh, who did fight in the 442nd and they have deep St. Louis roots. Um, and their son is, is living here um, current day. So, um, and then there's a few other, um, longtime members of the Japanese American Citizens League in St. Louis who have now passed away, who were members of the 442nd, um, which as many of you know, was one of the, I think the most highly decorated um, unit during the war, so. You're doing my job for me. I was, uh, I was gonna mention the Tanaka brothers. We'll, uh, we'll have another public program in September that will focus on the 100th, uh, 442nd, uh, which were mostly composed of Japanese Americans, like, uh, like Robin mentioned. Uh, Gordon Koizumi says, my father was a Kibe, someone born in the US, but sent back to Japan to be educated. He came back to the US before the start of World War II. Thank you, Gordon. Gordon is Janice's son. <laughs> not a question, but I want to contest the statement made at the beginning when Robin claimed not to be a historian. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Maybe that's another one of my relatives. <laughs> um, did Aunt Janice's husband lose his family in Hiroshima? Who did they live with when they went back or when they went? Yeah, and, and because Gordon's on the call, I feel extra pressure to get this right. But my understanding is that his family was still there in Hiroshima and um, they did live with them. And I believe my uncle Kay came from a fairly um, prosperous family. So, you know, they were lucky in that sense. But again, everybody was facing things like food shortages um, and things like that after the atomic bombing. So, as I said, I think my aunt had a rough time because she was not seen as, um, she was seen a little bit as the enemy because she had American ties. Right. Um, 
I, I also want to, if anyone is interested in uh, getting a, cl a closer perspective of uh, the bombing of Hiroshima, a couple of years ago by now, we, uh, we did a program with a survivor uh, who was uh, living very near Hiroshima uh, when the bomb went off. Um, we partnered with the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum uh, to, to put that on. Uh, so that should be on the Missouri Historical Society's YouTube page if anyone's interested in, in watching that. Uh, P.S. Great job, Robin, from the uh, Hiroshima question. Robin, can you tell us about your process of finding out about your family stories? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So I'm really lucky in that some of my um, elder relatives did some good research for me. So I have on my mother's side, my um, aunt who lived in California, who is um, gone now, she wrote a little book um, and, the, and the book was really more about leading up to the war than the war itself. But she collected all the information about my grandfather buying a motorcycle and going up and down the coast. And, you know, um, and then when I was a college student, I felt, um, I didn't mention this in the presentation, but I think a lot of Japanese Americans feel a sense of um, maybe a little bit of shame for being Japanese American. Um, there's, there's a bit of psychological trauma that's been inherited from this experience. And so when I was growing up, I didn't know much about my family history or Japan or Japanese culture. My parents do not like sushi. They don't use chopsticks. <laughs> they didn't teach us any language. Um, but when I went to college, I got curious and I started studying Japanese. Um, and I got really interested in going there. So I ended up living in Japan for five years um, when I was a young adult. And I purposely asked, I was in a program called the JET program that some of you may know, um, working for the government. And I asked if I could be stationed in Kumamoto, which is where my mother's family is from. And that was hugely educational because I met my relatives over there, including my grandma's youngest brother, who was supposed to be on the ship with her and go to America with her, but he got sick at the last minute and he couldn't go. Um, so he ended up staying in Japan. Um, and so I got to meet him and hear all of his stories and I got to see the house that she grew up in and hear about the silkworms and all of that. Um, so that was great. And then again, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, my father's side of the family, I know very little about it until Judy Mundell um, who lives here in St. Louis, did started doing research on the Janice Koizumi story. Um, she was a co-worker and dear friend of Janice's, and she said, I'm going to write up her story. And we were all like, oh, okay, you know, we don't, <laughs> okay, we don't know what that's going to look like. And she, she wrote an amazing book called The Block Manager, um, where a lot of these details came out. Um, and I do have some uh, recorded interviews of my aunts and uncles. I have some writings of my uncle Bob. Um, before he passed away, he wanted to share some of his stories. So here and there, I've been able to just collect um, information and start to piece it together. There's still a lot I don't know that I wish I knew. And um, you know, I think what I would love to do is go back to Japan and visit my father's side of the family from Nagoya and learn more about that side if I can someday. Yeah. Let's see, so uh, you, you mentioned this story of, of stopping on the train and the uh, lemonade and, and cookies. Um, there's a question about uh, how, did your family ever talk about uh, how they were treated in St. Louis, uh, you know, past yeah. then? So my mother and father have nothing but good things to say about St. Louis. Um, you know, when my parents were growing up here, my father uh, first settled in St. Charles. And that was because um, there's several stories, but one of the stories was that they were able to get housing because of my uncle's um, military status out in St. Charles. And back then it was just rural, you know, it's not the St. Charles we know today. Um, and my mother was, her family was in the city in South St. Louis. Um, both my parents say they did not feel that they were discriminated against, even though they were, you know, likely the only Japanese people in their schools or, you know, in their churches or in the grocery store. Um, 
they really have nothing but good things to say about St. Louis. And what I love about that is sometimes I feel like St. Louis gets a bad rap or we don't necessarily appreciate um, what we have here. <laughs> and, you know, the other, the other pieces, I work at Washington University and WashU was one of the few places that allowed students to come, um, Japanese American students to come and study instead of going into the camp. So because of that, we had some figures that again are gonna be featured in the exhibit, but people like Dick Henme and Gyo Obata, two famous architects, um, got to study architecture at WashU while their families were being interned. Um, and I think that's a real testament to WashU that they said, no, you know, we admitted these students, we want them to be here, even though it's wartime and all of the stuff is going on. So, um, yeah, on the whole, I would say St. Louis did a good job. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are you aware of any additional related advocacy efforts that are planned during the works? That are planned during? Uh, I read the question as it, as it was written. Um, I, I, I read it as, as referring to the movement for redress and reparations. Oh. Um... Or, or maybe um, similar to the uh, the recent protest against um, ha uh, holding immigrants at that at that one oh, site. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think there's a lot going on. Um, I would be remiss not to mention, of course, you know, in the last year there have been an uptick of um, hate crimes against Asian Americans related to uh, fear around COVID nineteen. Um, and again, a lot of that has happened on the West Coast and a little bit on the East Coast, more so than here. Um, <clears throat> it kind of goes to show that you can't ever not be vigilant. You can't be complacent and just say, oh, we did our job. Um, I don't want anyone to ever think that Japanese Americans feel like, okay, we got $20,000, we got an apology, we're good now. Um, I think it's incumbent upon us to to take that one success story and see how we can help others, you know, build coalitions, be successful in lobbying, um, think about ways to get compensation or social justice reparations. Um, so there are a lot of different things going on. And, and certainly after 9-11, I remember um, the Japanese American communities trying to really um, help Muslim Americans uh, understand, you know, I mean, it was a similar thing, right? We're getting Muslims detained um, without really, um, uh, what's the word, kind of a suspension of the regular rule of law, right? And it was sort of like, well, if you're Muslim and you look suspicious, we can detain you. It doesn't matter. That's a security issue, um, which were the same arguments that were used against the Japanese, even though really they didn't find any incidences of spying in the end amongst the Japanese um, after all that. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I think advocacy has to be a huge part of what we do going forward. Um, again, which is why I, you know, I like doing talks like this. That incubator story was was really remarkable. It speaks to the paranoia. I, uh, one piece of ad advocacy that that, um, that I'm aware of, I don't have the full story, um, but I, I think uh, we, we asked um, other countries in the Western Hemisphere to also detain Japanese mm. migrants and, mm. and second generation. Um, and, and I believe that some people, especially uh, uh, Peru, uh, Japanese Peruvians mm -hmm. uh, were held in the US for some reason mm -hmm. um, and that they were excluded from uh, the first round of reparations in the, in the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. um, because they weren't, it applied to citizens and permanent residents, I think. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. because they were Peruvians, um, they didn't uh, qualify. So, um, so some people, including, I, I think it's Nikkei progressives uh, have been pushing that and uh, um, only living people are eligible and anyone who who was around then is is getting quite old now, so right. it's a little bit of a race against time thing for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I had kind of heard about that, but I didn't know the details. So that's very interesting. I'm really, really shaky on the details too. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, they have to do it sooner rather than later. 
I think too there was there were people interned in the Aleutian Islands up by Alaska. Um, you know, when people when when you go to war or when you you fight, <laughs> all kinds of crazy things can happen, right? In the name of security. So um, I'm sure there are a lot of reparations to be made. So it is 7:30. Uh, so out of respect for people's time, I'm going to do my outro spiel, um, but Robin told me that she'd be willing to stay on a little bit later to answer more questions. Um, so uh, at, at this point, you are free if you'd like to, if you'd like to take off, um, but we will be answering a, a few more questions after this. So thank you to, to Robin for speaking tonight and to our ASL interpreters for their hard work. Uh, and thanks to everyone who tuned in tonight. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, when you close out uh, the webinar, your browser should automatically open a short survey. Uh, if you'd be willing to fill it out, we'd really appreciate that. And uh, a lot of our programming is at Missouri Historical Society is moving back in person, um, but we're still offering a lot of online programming. Um, just tomorrow uh, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., the Missouri Humanities Council is putting on the uh, Ulysses S. Grant Symposium at Soldiers Memorial. That's, that's going to be a hybrid program. It'll be live streamed. Um, you can get the link to reg. It does pr require pre-registration, but you can get that link at our website if you go to mohistory.org slash events. Um, that'll fe yeah, that'll feature, it's kind of an all day event that will feature four different speakers. Uh, and uh, this year's uh, topic is the United States Colored Troops. And then uh, Saturday, July 24th at 11 a.m., uh, the History Museum is putting on a program on Black history and disability rights. So, yes, so that's, that's my whole outro spiel, uh, so we can get back to the Q&A here. Um, Robin. Should yes, should I stop the share and just go to? Oh, yeah, that'd be fine. OK. All Thank right. you. Uh, Robin, very moving and informative presentation. I learned a lot. I will leave the session feeling both sadness and hopefulness. Your friend, April Chanel. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, do you have any idea how people started new lives on only $20? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I know in my father's side of the family, they talk a lot about how my oldest aunts um, quickly got jobs working as like governesses and housekeepers where they would live with a wealthy family. So my aunt Jean, for example, lived with, I think the family that was associated with the art museum um, and she took care of their children and she cooked and cleaned for them. Um, so a lot of families kind of broke up because they had to get out quickly and make a living. Um, and find jobs and uh, you know, somehow they made it work. I think you, you touched on this a, a little bit earlier uh, when, when you were preachy, but uh, we have, uh, what messages do you want your children to remember about this sad event? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, like you said, I, I uh, so, so some people don't like talking about things like the internment or the atomic bombing or, you know, it, it could be sad. And I understand for people who live through it that, you know, maybe they don't want to revisit that bad past. Um, but I personally think we have to revisit it. Um, we have to remind ourselves that these things happen and they can, they're always just around the corner, potentially waiting to happen again, if we don't learn from the history. Um, and also what I said before about sort of the psychological trauma of being Japanese, you know, um, the Japanese Americans tried so hard to integrate after the war. And they, I think they lost a lot of their culture in the process. Um, and then in my generation, we started to be interested again and say, you know, we want to learn the language. We want to know about the food. We want to know um, different traditions. And so you know, I'm, I'm happy these days that I see people from other countries where their children are being encouraged to keep their, you know, their native language or to keep a tie with their country. Um, I don't think we should feel threatened by that, you know. Um, you can come to this country and uh, you should be able to retain ties to your native culture while still being American. That's what I would hope my 
you know future generations would would feel. Thank you. Um, Robin, thank you so much for your presentation. I've learned so much. Did your family stay in contact with any of their friends or neighbors from California after they settled in St. Louis? Did anyone from your family stay in touch with anyone they met in the internment camp? Yeah, I don't know if they stayed in touch with people in California. Um, that would be something maybe my cousin Gordon would know about my oldest aunt or something. Uh, I get the feeling that most people kind of just had to sort of say goodbye to everyone and everything. Um, <clears throat> as far as friends made in camp, I do believe that there were some ties sustained. And actually what's fun is, you know, my, my mom was the youngest of her family. My dad was the youngest of his family and their sisters, their older sisters actually knew each other. So, um, you know, later on they met and they fell in love and got married or whatever, but the families did actually know each other from camp. Huh. Did your uncle have access to extra food or did he forgo eating to share his MREs? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know. He might have done a combination <laughs> of some of his food and then hoarding maybe food from friends and stuff like that. Um, but you know, I imagine during that time, so that was the time that the American military occupied Japan and were trying very um, diligently to instill democracy in that country. They were pumping a lot of money into that country. Um, they were trying to make sure that, you know, from the ashes would rise a modern democratized Japan that no longer kind of had these ambitions to take over East Asia. Um, so he probably was lucky and he probably had access to, to some resources there, um, thanks to the military and, and all the, the money they had. Robin, uh, Patsy Hattori says, Robin, I believe Uncle Hank was in the 442nd. Oh, he was, okay. So Uncle Hank is the one who got his chicken um, lamp taken away. <laughs> okay. So apparently he fought in the 442nd. Thank you, Patsy. Oh. Uh, how was your uncle Howell's experience as a Japanese American citizen in the U.S. Army during the war? Great job, yeah. Rungsi and Nancy. <laughs> so my uncle Hal is, I, I admire him so much, but he ended up being a career military guy, even though he got drafted out of the internment camp, much to his mother's dismay. Um, he ended up staying in the military for a number of years, and he fought in the Korean War, and he also fought in the Vietnam War before he finally retired from the military. And, you know, I think he, um, I, I have to imagine, he's never said this to me, but I have to imagine it was probably strange because he fought in three wars against Asians um, as an American, but he himself was Asian American. Um, and yet he must have been fiercely loyal to, to stick, stick it out through three wars like that. Um, I have a piece of writing that he wrote. He wrote a poem about being in the camps and he talks about, um, you know, feeling betrayed by his country and, and losing their freedom and how freedom is supposed to be the paramount American value. So I think he's a, he was a poetic guy and he felt deeply, but ultimately he loved his country and, um, you know, he, he fought in three wars for it. Oh. And he's still alive, by the way. He's like 97 right now. Oh, wow. He lives in Tokyo. And uh, like I mentioned before, we will have a program in September that focuses on Japanese American military service during World War II. Um, great job, Robin. A, oh, sorry. I think there's going to be a stamp that's coming out soon from the U.S. Postal Service that has a Japanese American soldier, and it says, go for broke which is the motto of the 442nd that's supposed to be issued here pretty soon. Oh, cool. Yeah. I hadn't heard about that. Uh, great job, Robin. How has your family legacy impacted the youngest generation of Hattori's? Um, so I think my nieces, you know, they, they have the benefit of, they have people like me being really pushy and sharing these stories, whether they want to hear them or not. <laughs> Whereas when I was young, I didn't, I, my parents didn't talk a whole lot about it. They didn't know a whole lot about it. And I had to kind of prod. And um, so I think for, you know, the younger generation, they have the benefit of a lot more information and it's more available. And even that, um, 
thing I showed you where, you know, it has the, which, which uh, barrack actually families were in and stuff. Like there are people right now doing research um, on lots of aspects of this era that just wasn't available 20, 30 years ago. So sure. I'm happy for, you know, the younger generation that I think they'll, they'll have access to a lot of that information. Similar-ish question. Amazing job, Robin. How did your family's experience affect you as a person? Did this affect your career choices, for example? How does this knowledge approach uh, how you engage with others and educate others on the harm done to your family? Yeah, so um, I think part of the reason I wanted to study Japanese so much in college was because I felt this sense of why don't I know my own culture? And then that led down this path of what was the internment about and what you know, lasting effect did it have? And I ended up doing some projects in school. I went to Georgetown. Um, so one of my political science papers, for example, was about the passing of the redress bill. And I traced how the bill went through Congress, where it started, where it got revised, you know, how they were able to get it signed. Um, Cause it was quite uh, an interesting and unusual case actually at that time. Um, so I did do a few things like that. and. I think now, I mean, I just try to be an empathetic person, <laughs> you know, I don't always know what's going on with other people. I can't say that um, I always understand things, but, you know, I think there's lots of sides to every story and it's, it's very easy. You know, we've become very polarized these days um, and we, we tend to make quick decisions, um, but everything's always a little bit more complicated than mm -hmm. you think. So <laughs> that's kind of how I try to approach it. That's, that's a good rule of thumb, yeah. <laughs> um, my father's family lived in, oh, this is Gordon. Um, my father's family lived in what is now the neighboring city to Hiroshima. My father's family did have property. My father had Japan-born sisters and others to look after as he was the eldest son. We did lose some family members who lived in Hiroshima who died in the atomic bombing from what I was told. Wow. Thanks for sharing that, Gordon. Yeah, I don't know anything about that side of your story, so. Um, I appreciate you mentioning inherited psychological trauma. I think that's a really important point. Did the process of learning more about your family's story have any effect on that inherited trauma? What kind of conversations about inherited trauma and healing have you had with your family? Um, my case is different in that, you know, because my mother and father were so young, and, you know, they talk about camp as like, well, I got to play with my friends, you know, and I didn't really know what was going on. Um, I think they didn't, they themselves did not have a sense of trauma, right? It was more um, broader, sort of in broader brushstrokes as I started thinking about just Japanese Americans and how we conduct ourselves in society. Um, and, and then also learning some of the stories from older people who were teenagers or young adults in the camps and had a little bit more to say than my parents did. Um, was that, did I answer the question? Was there a second part to that? I, no, I, 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 think, I think you, oh, it was, uh, what kinds of conversations about inherited trauma and healing have you had with your family? Oh, um, yeah, we've definitely talked about like why, why we, lost our culture why you know and um my parents are so american that my father when he visited me in japan he said i don't know how to use chopsticks so he brought his own fork from america <laughs> nice. that's how american he is <laughs> um and we tease each other about these things um but i i mean i think ultimately um he recognizes that maybe something was lost there and he's probably glad that I, you know, people like me are, are digging up the past a little bit and learning more about it. And when my parents did visit me in Japan, I think they really enjoyed that. In fact, the $20,000 that both of my parents got, um, some of it helped pay their house payment <laughs> and then some of it helped them to visit me in Japan. Um, so I thought that was money well spent. Definitely. We've got two more short ones here, and then we should probably call it after that. I really appreciate the extra time you're putting into this. Um, Jody Matori says, hi, Robin. How can people find out more about the local JACL chapter? 
Oh, good, good question, Jody. <laughs> so we have a website, um, stlouisgacl.org, and um, we have a Gmail address. It's stljacl1 at gmail.com. Um, feel free to contact us or to go on the website and get some more information. Um, we welcome you, whether you're Japanese or not. Um, if you just have interest in social justice and civil rights issues, um, it'd be a good fit for you. If you like Japanese culture, we do some of that as well. Um, so yeah, please do check out the website. Yeah, absolutely. I put the link in the chat. Thank you. Um, and finally, Robin, great job. I'm very proud of you and your presentation. This is uh, Todd Hayataka. Uh, can you tell us how your parents met? My parents met, so my, as I said, the families kind of knew each other from camp. And my mother's brother, so my mother had nine people in her, in her siblings. It was one boy, wow. <laughs> eight girls, one boy. The one boy, he used to play poker with my dad's brother, um, not Hal, but another brother, Ted, and they were best friends. And so, um, one day my dad saw them all play or, you know he used to join in the poker and one day he said to my mom's brother hey i want to go on a date with one with your sister and because my uncle bob had eight sisters he was like which one <laughs> there's a lot <laughs> it turned out he had his eye on my mom <laughs> so that's how they met um and then they went out and they got married um let's see uh, some of you might be familiar with the Loving case where um, interracial couples were not allowed to get married. And um, so some of my cousins uh, who are also of that era um, could not get married in St. Louis. It was illegal for Japanese and a white person to get married or Japanese and a black person, for example. And they had to go to Illinois to get married. Um, my mother and father, since they're both Japanese American, they did not face that obstacle. Um, so they were able to get married and I think uh, they're celebrating their 56th or 7th, no, maybe 60th wow. anniversary. Yeah, they've been together a long time. <laughs> That's wild. Well, thank you again, Robin. Thank you again to our interpreters and, and to the audience. Um, stay tuned for more Writing Wrong related um, uh, programs. Uh, come down to Soldiers Memorial downtown and check out the exhibit while, while it's up. Like I said, it's only up for 10 weeks. So anybody who's local, uh, come check it out. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jamie.